Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar on the importance of diversity and equal opportunities in a healthy R&D environment. This event is hosted by IFPMA and Hyper, which is a group dedicated to empowering, connecting, and mobilizing young leaders and future decision makers in the life sciences industry. Just a reminder that this event will be recorded and will be available afterwards. But before we get started, I'd like to invite you to click the link that will appear in the chat box. It will ask you to fill in a one word answer to the question, what does diversity and inclusion mean to you? So at the end of the webinar, we'll be able to share the responses in a word cloud. Um, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Courtney Suna, and I manage AstraZeneca's Global Community Investment and Philanthropy. My work is focused on our Young Health Program, which is AstraZeneca's flagship philanthropic initiative. It runs in 35 countries in partnership with over 30 nonprofits, and it aims at accelerating sustainable healthcare solutions and improving equitable access. But I'm also personally very, very passionate about this topic. I'm on the board of the Women's Leadership Organization, supporting women as leaders, and I recognize that some of the most marginalized people in the world have often worse health, well, healthcare and economic outcomes. So it's my hope that we can work together to achieve equitable access. On today's webinar, you'll be hearing from some incredibly successful and passionate women that I'm thrilled to be sharing the stage with. They come from different sectors, different experiences and backgrounds, but all with a passion to accelerate inclusion and diversity in the healthcare sector. So please let me uh, introduce our panelists. First, we have Sharon Olmsted. She's the Head of Regulatory and Development Policy at Novartis. Sharon, would you like to say hello? Thanks, Courtney. And, and thanks to IFPMA and the Hyper Group for uh, including me in this really important event. Um, very excited to be here um, as a uh, woman in science. Um, it's been an interesting journey. I'm excited to share that. Uh, diversity and inclusion is such an important piece of what we do in R&D. And I think we're making some important strides um, in recent years. Um, so I'm excited to be able to talk about that today. Great, thank you, Sharon. And next we have Rocio Perez. She is the Research and Development Project research Coordinator at UCD. Hi, hello everyone. I'm Rocio Martinez Perez and I'm a pharmacist. I work for UCB since summer 2020 as a project coordinator in R&D. And I would like to share my journey during this webinar, more a perspective from someone that is still new in this industry. So I would like to share with you all my early talent journey here at UCB. Thank you. Thank you, Rocio. Next, we have Marie Chantal Yumanyana. She is a founder and winner of the IFPMA's Speak Up Africa Women Innovators Incubator. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yumanyana Marie Chantal, and I'm the innovator, the founder of Umde Elevet. I'm glad to be here today to share with you the journey as, an, as a young innovator and also learn from different people about diversity and inclusion. Glad to be here today. Thanks, Marie. And last but not least, we have with us Laura Adams. She is the Global Program Manager for the, for the Young Healthcare Program at Plant International UK. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here. It's very, very good to be on this panel. Um, so as Courtney said, I'm currently managing the Young Health Program. Um, but my previous role was the Gender Equality Advisor at Plan UK. So I've worked on implementing the feminist leadership principles, which I'll talk a bit about today, and um, on the DNI journey that Plan's been on for the last couple of years. So looking forward to talking to you all today. Thanks, Laura. Um, I am actually going to be handing it back over to Laura. As she mentioned, um, she is with Plan International UK, which is a global children's charity and a girls' rights organization. And we thought it would be incredibly interesting to hear more about inclusion and diversity in practice from a nonprofit perspective. So she'll be speaking with you about feminist leadership principles and anti-racism principles. She'll also be available for the panel discussion and Q&A later on. Thanks. Can everyone see that? Yes, all set, Laura. Great, thank you. So I'm going to be talking about a couple of initiatives that we've used at PLAN over the last 
couple of years to to support and improve our DNI. Um, so, firstly, I'll talk about the feminist leadership principles. So, Plan decided that we wanted to be a more feminist organisation more actively. Um, so, we decided to create some feminist principles that are grounded on um, feminism and feminist principles of social justice and equality and equity. So, three years ago, Plan did uh, an organisation wide consultation. Um, to develop these 10 principles, which we're now embedding throughout the organization. And we hope that by, by embedding them and by living them as an organization, we can um, become more inclusive. So currently each department is now developing their own action plan to enacting those feminist leadership principles. So I'm just gonna run through them and what they look like in practice. So firstly, we have self-awareness and courage. So in practice, this could be like having honest reflection sessions after big pieces of work or on a regular basis to discuss what went well, what could improve and recognizing that, providing honest feedback to each other and acting on that feedback. Um, also, this could be managers role modeling, admitting their mistakes and showing vulnerability. Secondly, we have self and collective care. So in practice, this could be managers role modelling, working within their paid hours and encouraging their colleagues to do the same, um, encouraging colleagues to take toil when they've worked overtime and having open discussions about well-being and mental health. Thirdly, we've got collective accountability. So in practice, this could be reducing hierarchies, um, encouraging team discussions about goals and objective setting and having shared ownership about the outcomes of those discussions and taking them forward. And then also ensuring that all team members can play an active role in taking forward and leading on plans. So in the team I'm in, we have daily calls so that we can all um, know all of the information and work together on um, implementing the programme. Next, we have diversity. So in practice, these are some examples, and these are all being done by the Young Health Programme team at Plan UK at the moment. So we're gonna be celebrating Ramadan by writing an internal blog on how our programmes are celebrating and adapting their programmes accordingly. We use pronouns in our email signatures. We have what we call DNI Thursdays, which is at our team meeting every Thursday, a different person brings a different topic on DNI to discuss to try and just really normalize discussions on, di on diversity and inclusion. Um, and then another example is having people from non-dominant groups being visible in positions of power um, and being role models. Then we have zero tolerance to sexual harassment and discrimination. So in practice, um, this might be training of managers in how to respond to issues of discrimination and sexual harassment, having visible zero tolerance for any incidents so that others feel empowered to report and also having open discussions on what racism and microaggressions look like in your particular organisation so that people feel empowered to call incidents in or out. Then we have tackling bias. So there's two very significant examples of how we've um, tried to tackle bias at PLAN. Um, so we have two um, courses that are open to all staff and kind of obligatory for all staff, but we're, it's a slow process. Um, so the first one is power, privilege and bias. And this takes small groups on a five week journey to reflect on their own power, privilege and bias and how that impacts on how they work and how we work with our programmes globally. And to think about how we can really reflect on that and have develop an, an action plan to, to, to use our privilege wisely and to share power. And then once people have gone through that, that course, there's an anti-racism course, which, which reflects on the roots of racism, what racism looks like in our organisation. We hear from people with lived experience of racism, and then we think about how we personally can be more actively anti-racist. Um, then some other examples are having open discussions with colleagues about racism and how they've experienced it. Um, reflecting on our own conscious and unconscious bias and how that might have affected others negatively and making personal plans for changing our biases and listening to the voices of people with lived experience. And then just to stress that it's not enough to just train staff on diversity. People need to understand where racism comes from and what racism looks like in their context in order to challenge it. And that's very much the root of our anti-racism course. So moving on to share power. 
Um, so in practice, this could be enabling team members um, to access decision making spaces that they wouldn't necessarily normally have access to elevating them to those decision making spaces and supporting them to be able to meaningfully interact and engage in those spaces. And then another example is trusting partners and staff and empowering them to make their own decisions. Um, so the next one is purpose driven. So in practice, this could be striving to be gender transformative in our programming and empowering staff networks that focus on justice and equality. So at PLAN, we have a gender champions network and an equality collective network. Joyful in co-creating. So this one recognizes the importance of team building and of instilling trust and enjoyment and being kind and respectful to each other. And then finally, honoring the movement. So this is about choosing and empowering partner organizations who are furthering the feminist movement and working towards social justice globally. So then moving on to our anti-racism comms principles. So these are um, these have recently been developed to support us in our internal and external comms to really interrogate how we are um, sharing information and to be more actively anti-racist within that. Um, so the background is that we acknowledge the prevalence of structural and systemic racism and that plan has a responsibility to drive change. Um, we acknowledge the importance of an active approach, so making the distinction between non-racist and between being non-racist and anti-racist. And we recognise that this is a process, so we're interrogating how we've previously operated and deciding on how we could change. So these are our principles. I won't go through them all in detail, but I'll just pick out a few. So recognizing our power and privilege, avoiding harmful, harmful stereotypes and colonial narratives, promoting the voices, the voices of the people we work with. So hearing from people with lived experience um, and actively challenging racism wherever we find it. And then finally, I just wanted to talk a bit about intersectionality. And I'm sure that many of you are already very familiar with that term, but just um, to go over a, a quote which explains it really nicely. Intersectionality is an analytical lens that helps us to understand that all forms of oppression are interlinked. It's the acknowledgement that, that everyone has their own unique experiences of discrimination and oppression that can't be separated out from each other. So this explains how individual characteristics such as gender, race, class, ability and sexuality intersect with one another and overlap to become multiple layered identities and this influences privilege and oppression and this is really important because it guides us in how important it is not to homogenize groups we must apply an intersectional approach so on my next slide i'm just going to go through some findings from a recent bond survey so bond is a uk network of ngos and in 2020, they did a survey with 150 people of colour who are working in international development on their experiences of racism in international development. Um, so I'm going to utilise some of those findings to show the importance of intersectionality. But firstly, I just want to recognise that I don't have lived experience of any of these issues. I'm just using this platform to elevate these issues. So I'll just move that. Um, so just a couple of statistics, 78% of black women living in countries where development programmes are implemented face discrimination when applying for roles at UK NGOs. But compare this to 48% of people of colour. So if we homogenise the group people of colour, we get a very different picture than if we disaggregate further and actually understand the experiences of different groups within that, for example, black women. And of those people who fail to get an interview despite meeting all of the job criteria, 70% more women of colour. And then finally, just a quote to illustrate this point. So someone who was surveyed said, where are all my role models? Senior managers in my organisation are about 95% white. I've been looking for a mentor who looks like me for almost two years, but they're few and far between. So I think this really illustrates the importance of not homogenising groups and not assuming that one person representing a broad group can represent everyone within that group and therefore the importance of an intersectional approach. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for putting that together and sharing. I felt like it was so interesting and helpful to see those principles in practice. I think we can all have some 
takeaways and ideas that we can bring back to our teams and our organizations. Um, and I'm sure we'll have some, some questions for you from the audience at the end. So again, thank you so much for putting that together. Um, I've just been told that the poll is live now. So if you click on poll, uh, the audience should be able to answer it. Um, but, and right as we're about to move into the panel discussion, which Laura, you'll be joining us for, which is great. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to, to Sharon first. Um, Sharon, I wanted to ask, why, why is it important to you to support the next generation of women in science? And how can we work to achieve gender balance at the highest levels? Thanks, Courtney. Well, obviously, this is something that's um, near and dear to my own heart. Um, I think as we explore diversity and inclusion, it really is fundamental to catalyze innovation and uh, performance. The, the more voices we bring to the table, uh, the better ideas we get. Um, personally, from my own journey, you know, I, I, my observation really came as I went through university as a biology student and watched the numbers of female uh, students decrease as the uh, length of study went on, um, which was just an observation, I didn't think much about it. And then as I got into industry and grew my career in industry, I found that uh, I was becoming one of one in meetings. So I was the, as I, I used to say, the last girl standing uh, in the meeting room. And while I initially thought that was a great accomplishment, I was very proud of myself. I began to question why is this happening? What's going on? Where, where, where is everybody else? Um, and so for me, it became a bit of a mission to help and uh, support young women coming into the, the field of science and, and industry, our industry in particular, and mentoring them. Now, as I've gone further in my career, one of the things that um, we've been doing at Novartis in particular in terms of addressing gender equity really has to do with uh, pay equity. That's a, that's a big piece of it and gender balance within our management ranks. So at Novartis, we actually pledged in 2018, uh, we joined the uh, Pay Equity International Coalition or EPIC, uh, really to achieve gender balance in management and also improve our pay equity and transparency process by uh, 2023. And so we've made some very specific commitments around that. Um, in terms of renewing, removing bias in the system. So one of the things that we do is uh, we don't actually consider historic salary uh, when a candidate is coming in because that carries with it certain biases that may have come from previous roles. Um, so that's not considered. What's considered is your qualifications for the role, your experience, and that's what's uh, calculated based on the pay scale that we have for a particular role. Um, we've also created a transparency around our pay. Um, so you know where you sit, not only what is your pay range, so you see that from a market perspective, but you also see where do you fit within that range against your peers, your entire uh, peer set. So you, you know whether or not you are being paid equitably um, compared to your peers. I think that's been a really important piece of um, helping to address that, that uh, gender equity uh, within our, our ranks. Thanks, Sharon, that's really interesting. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that Novartis is making such enormous strides when it comes to achieving gender equality at, at all levels throughout the organization and supporting people to learn and grow and develop and have that transparency around pay, which can be a, a stigmatizing topic to talk about. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd like to move, move next to Rocio. Um, Rocio, you mentioned that it's important for you as a young professional to feel that you're playing a role in advancing change and being the voice of youth. So could you talk a little bit about the ERG that you're involved with, Emerge, and how it supports the development of diverse young people? Yeah, of course. Thank you for, for the question. Um, well, uh, Emerge is a community here at UCB, it's an ERG, where our main objective, um, the top one, is to create a sense of belonging. Of course, to belong a, a community, but also to belong um, a company. And how do we do this? Uh, well, you have to boost the confidence 
and also you have to develop yourself personally. So how do we do this at Emerge? Well, first of all, we are working with, with the company uh, in creating more welcoming spaces where you can, through less casual uh, setting, connect with other people. Uh, moreover, through, through those events, uh, of course, you expand your own individual's network, but besides your daily stakeholders are colleagues you, you work with every day. Moreover, well, as a newcomer, I would like to bring a bit uh, my journey and, well, joining a big corporation, it can be or it can feel a bit intimidating. You can feel a bit intimidating and daunting. Um, that's why we have one of our initiatives is Guide Me program. Uh, this is a mentoring program where you join a senior position for the beginning of the onboarding and you are a mentor uh, for the whole onboarding. That, that it's, it helps a lot. And then I would like also to share um, the Explorer program. Um, with this program, we are boosting the, the curiosity. What is this about Explorer program? It's about um, yeah, curiosity and discover new things. So you can work in a different department for, for three months. And maybe you might discover something that you like because I, I don't know if you would agree with me, but we are seeing less and less linear careers. But the only way to, to really discover something new is by trying. So we are bringing to the, into the table, of course, a new position. But as I think uh, it was mentioned uh, previously, maybe you can work for three months in a department that really needs a lot of experience, professional experience that as a newcomer, we do not have. So those are some of the initiatives that we are working on right now. Of course, we are challenging ourselves daily to, to improve and come up with, with new initiatives. Thank you. Thanks, Rocio. And I think one of the big takeaways was getting involved in new experiences and, and have, you know, that leads to experiencing you know, new ways of working, new people, new ideas, and that all leads to us being more, more inclusive in our work. So thank you so much for sharing your perspective. Um, I'd like to turn now to Marie Chantal. Um, as a young female innovator, I'm, I'm so impressed by all of the work that you've done. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how technology can be used as a tool to provide greater access to healthcare information, because you're a female innovator and the work that you do is also centered around women's health. So could you please talk a little bit about how digital can provide access to healthcare. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to first uh, maybe talk about what I do because it's more related to how technology can be used as a tool to make maternal health information accessible or maternal health improved. So for us at Mobile Elevate, what we do is providing information um, using digital platform like social medias. We have information that we post on social media on a regular basis and people can, can get it because most of people nowadays are using social medias. So that's one way uh, that we are, we are using. The second is web application. It's a web application where maternal information or health information is available anytime and you can just browse and get the information. Those are one of the tools that we are using, but technology as one, the new way of living, a new way of having things getting done easily. I think it's something that we can all use to to improve maternal health or health in general. For example, um, for now you can call without going to the hospital. You can get information using just your, your mobile phone. You can get information using um, either educate yourself or empower yourself using what is available already in, in this technology era like Google or maybe other things. But the issue is 
for the Google, there are a lot of information. And for people who have not been in, for example, medical career or in health professional, they can't know which one to trust, which is what we are doing. For us, we are making evidence-based information accessible and easily available. And we are making people get to know that this is a trust source. Yeah, I think uh, using social media and what is available can be one of the tools in technology to get health improved. Thank you. Thanks, Marie Chantal. I, I, I know how important it is to make sure that people are getting the right information, because as you say, anyone can go and Google and find the wrong information, but helping them find trusted information can be critical. And I, I wanted to ask a follow up question to you because your work is really centered around supporting women's health care and women have access to health care. And considering the audience that we have on the call today, which is primarily in the healthcare industry, um, could you talk a little bit about why healthcare or R&D decision makers should prioritize women's health? Thank you so much. Um, first of all, what is women's or maternal health? It is what we do to ensure that women, children and families are in healthy condition. What that does mean, it means that a woman is a cornerstone to the family and the whole community. Let me bring this up. According to WHO, in 2017, 810 women died every day from preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth. And 94% of this were happening in low and middle income countries. If we could imagine 810 children who were left, how are they going to, to grow up or survive? How are, who is going to guide them and educate them about maybe reproductive health or other things related to maybe twist, twi twist and turns of adolescence? Imagine 810 families who are left they are going to be hardly suffering and shaken because the mothers are not there. And these 810 children are prone to have stunting, isn't it? So um, first of all, I think um, maternal health has been not been tackled well because looking at maternal health, mot maternal mortality, reduction was one of one goal for the millennium developmental goals. And we still have it in sustainable development goals. It means um, there is a need for the RMDs to ensure that maternal health, new technology, new treatment, the way of preventing, preventing these causes of mortality is being, being addressed. I personally uh, appreciate the role of innovation and technology towards achieving maternal health. However, there is still a challenge in the low and middle income countries who, who have limitation on access to, to health and also technology. So it's in that regard that I would like to ask um, different pharmaceutical industries, different RMDs, different decision makers to work together toward achieving this um, maternal health. And as we know, optimizing maternal health, it means we are optimizing the healthy future for the coming generation. I think that's what I can talk about this. Great. Thank you, Marie Chantal. Um, I'd like to finally turn to Laura. Um, again, thank you for, for putting that incredible presentation together. I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit more about intersectionality and why it's important to consider in our work in DNI and how we can achieve this. Thanks. Yeah. Um, 
so I think intersectionality is so important because if we homogenize across groups, then we risk further elevating privileged groups and further oppressing non-dominant groups. So it's something we really need to consider in DNI. So some things how we can try and bring this into our DNI approach um, would be by understanding which dominant and non-dominant groups are within your organization, who's being attracted to work at your organization, who's being recruited and why, and which groups are not and why. Um, look at which groups are most prominent at high levels and lower levels and think about why that is and what are the barriers that some groups or intersecting groups are facing and how we can break down those barriers. Um, always having in mind the importance of not applying a blanket approach because each person and their combination of identities is unique. So for example, having opportunities or safe spaces for women without recognizing that different groups within women might be experiencing different levels of discrimination. For example, women of color or women with disabilities. Um, and then some recommendations of how we could do this. At an individual level, um, recognize your privilege if you have privilege and how you can use that to be an ally so for me as a white person I know that I'm more likely to be in a position of power and therefore I need to make an additional effort to understand what my position is within the power structure and how I can use that to bring about positive change also it's important to know and understand what your organizational anti-racism and DNI policies are so that you can use them and feel confident to call in or out issues um, also try and understand people's lived experience of discrimination within the organisation and how multiple oppressions interact and what that looks like. Um, and then at an organisational level, you can embed commitments on anti-racism, inclusion and feminist leadership into recruitment, work plans and performance appraisals. And this is particularly important for managers. Um, so we've done that at Plan and we've recently done our midterm uh, appraisals and as part of that, as standard, we went through our feminist leadership principles and discussed how we were delivering on them and what we could improve. Also, it's important to have difficult conversations about what racism and all forms of discrimination look like at your organisation. It's really important to, to find out what that experience is, not just talk abstractly. Um, also ensure that there are support services for people experiencing discrimination and create safe spaces in which people can discuss their experiences and recognize that just by calling something a safe space doesn't make it a safe space. We need to understand what the people who, who need that safe space will need to feel safe in that environment. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. That, it actually reminds me of a comment that Rocio had made around creating self, um, safe spaces for young people and how important that is in an organization as well. Um, so I, I feel like this is coming full circle with, with so many different ways that we need to think about it. But um, I wanted to quickly turn to Sharon um, because Sharon's previous role was with the US FDA and in her current role with Novartis, she is working to ensure that there's diversity in clinical trials. So Sharon, could you talk a little bit about why this is important and how having diverse clinical trials can accelerate access to healthcare. Thanks, Courtney. So really the importance here, thinking about diversity in clinical trials is it's, it's important to determine the relevance of the data um, across the populations that are actually intended to use our products um, in the clinic. Uh, because if we only have a select population, then we're not actually reflecting uh, the, the, the the actual real world population that's gonna get it. And that may impact safety and efficacy um, because we don't know that information. Now, when we think about this, um, we actually haven't in the past had a good understanding of some of the challenges that have affected um, the lack of diversity in our clinical trials. So we need to understand what our patient population is experiencing when it comes to recruitment challenges, uh, site selection, um, are the sites near our patients that are needing the product the most that are gonna give us the broadest diversity? Um, are we recruiting in a way that reaches all of our potential patients? Uh, Marie Chantel talked about technology and using um, social media. I think there's a lot of different ways now that we can reach out to patients that maybe we didn't in the past, we didn't think about that is more um, inclusive in that way. 
Are we selecting sites that are uh, reachable, that you can actually get to the site, that it's in your community? Um, are we including trial uh, staff, uh, the site staff, the PIs, are they diverse? Do we have a population that when a patient comes in, there's a physician or a, a, a staff member that looks like them, that, that is relatable to them? Um, these are some of the things that are really uh, important in terms of how we try to uh, better engage and better increase uh, diversity in our trials. Uh, the pandemic really shone a light on the inequities in our healthcare systems as a whole, uh, particularly around getting treatment and care, but it especially showed a, um, a light on our ecosystem, our clinical trial ecosystem. Um, and so you mentioned my, my former time at FDA and, and the work I do now because we do monitor and we work with all the different regulators around the world. Um, in the middle of the pandemic, FDA issued a guidance talking about how to increase diversity. And it was really about challenging the, the standards, the, the status quo, right, around eligibility criteria. So if you're thinking about a phase two trial where you have a very restrictive inclusion criteria, um, do you need to carry those restrictions forward into your phase three? Can you broaden your inclusion criteria or can you design a trial that's adaptive so that over time, as you learn more, you can bring a broader population into the, into the trial? The, the enrollment practices I just mentioned using new tools um, and then um, just the site selection is so critically important. I think all of those tend to lead to a better outcome in terms of our, our trial uh, data because we are more reflective of those patients that will receive our, our drugs in, in, the, um, in the clinics. And I know many, many companies have started down a path and a journey looking at how they can improve their diversity in their clinical trials. I, I can tell you from some of the work that we're doing at Novartis, if you put the effort in, it does make a difference and it does work. You just have to plan for it at the front end of your clinical trials. Um, we've made some commitments in terms of not just looking at how we can improve the way we recruit, the tools that we use in the trials, the way that we design our trials, but also in ensuring that there is um, the, the, the educational opportunities. Um, we, we partnered up with uh, Morehouse uh, School of Medicine and 26 of the historically black universities and colleges, or colleges and universities, excuse me, um, to fund mentorships and scholarships uh, and really to advance opportunities to bring that next generation of uh, medical uh, professionals into uh, the field and participate um, as our investigators or our site staff. We also are working to educate referring physicians why it's important to recommend your patient uh, to be part of a clinical trial, something that in the past um, physicians may uh, be reluctant to do with their diverse patients. So, so these are a number of things that are going on and, and we're not we're not alone in doing this. Many other companies are doing this as well. And our trade associations are also um, participating in this, but I think it's a really important step um, to ensure that our labels reflect um, the information necessary to treat the patients that will ultimately receive our products. Great, thank you, Sharon. And I, I also caught on how you're working collaboratively with different nonprofits and organizations to provide mentorship as well and um, reaching and supporting young people to develop. So I think as a pharmaceutical industry and as a healthcare sector, we have the responsibility to work collaboratively with multi-sectoral groups. Um, and of course, the, following the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals and partnerships for the goals as an SDG, that's great to hear as well. So. I think I'll wrap up the wrap up the panel for now because I I realize that we might have some questions from the audience. Um, but first, I just wanted to remind everyone on the call to please, if you haven't already, click the link in the chat for um, a word cloud because we'd love to hear more about what diversity and inclusion means to you. Um, so we've posted that again for you there. Um, um, 
we do, oh, I just did got, got a chat very quickly from Chantal, um, who would like to share a little bit more um, about safe spaces before we turn it over to the audience. So Marie Chantal, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Laura, for bringing this up. Um, at Homogia Elevate, we, we offer the safe spaces, and it's been one of the most impactful way of educating people. Um, for us, what we do, um, we provide a specific safe, safe space for people to come, openly discuss, and learn different things. Uh, for example, if it's a like the last time what we have was a women's safe space. It means if it's a mother safe space, even the, the, the experts that are coming into the safe space should be mothers so that they really feel um, themselves and be able to share their experience, their thought and feelings about different things. And it was so impactful in in breaking biases. A lot of people have biases and myths that are, that has been transmitted from generation to generation. And they they have no trusted source to get those information from. But through the safe spaces, it's a, it's a moment for people to learn. It's a moment for people to get support, specifically emotional support, psychological support, or, because they 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 are afraid to express their, their experiences and to break the biases which is one of the main contributing um to to maternal mortality because people are not well informed to make the right decision so thanks Laura, for bringing this up the safe space is one way of really educating people and providing the right information in a good way that people feel free to learn and they are willing to learn and mostly they get even the support. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Marie Chantal. So now we're going to turn it over to the Q&A portion of the call. Um, because it's a, a webinar format, you'll need to actually pop questions from the audience into the chat and I'll be able to read them aloud to the audience. So if you have any to the panelists, sorry. So if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat. <laughs> I'll give everyone a minute to type and again, don't forget to pull out the word cloud. Um, and while, oh, it looks like we have a question from Will Scharf. He asks, what are the panel's perspective on pharmaceutical companies appointing chief diversity and inclusion officers? How should this work? How can we make it a success? Is there anyone who would like to answer that question? Sharon, I wonder if you might be best placed. I hate to put you on the spot. <laughs> no worries. I was just typing to say, sure. Um, no, I, I think this is a really important um, step in our journey, right? It, it shows the commitment to companies um, in making that cultural change, because it really, we have to change the DNA of the company and how we see diversity and inclusion. And I think Laura's comments in the programs that she shared from AstraZeneca uh, really reflect a, a significant um, shift change in how we go about doing this and, and having that commitment to having a, a position at that level really reflects a company's culture. And you know, I think one of the things, at least from my own experiences, we're now having these difficult conversations, right? We're, we're openly talking about the challenges that our colleagues face that, that maybe we didn't appreciate um, from our own perspectives. Those inherent biases, I think that we were talking about learning to understand what those are and how to address those. And I think each leader within a company needs to um, take that on as part of our responsibility and to really be able to, um, to model what is expected in, in inclusive leadership 
uh, style. So I think it's great. I think it's, but it's, I think it's a journey though, too. And so we have to be honest with ourselves, any companies that are taking this on, that it's going to take effort from everyone. We all have to be there and we have to be open. We have to be courageous um, to hear the conversation. Um, we have to recognize that sometimes it's going to be very uncomfortable, especially if you sit in a position um, of privilege. Um, you have to be really open to hearing what's being said so that you can be part of the solution. Um, so I, I think it's a really exciting time to be in the industry right now and, and to be part of this journey. Great. Thank you, Sharon. Looks like Rocio wanted to speak. Rocio, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to, to share, well, from a uh, newcomer to, to this industry, how to make it a success. Uh, well, I think the change comes from everywhere. Society is multi-generational, even if we are talking about chief, uh, chief uh, into a chief position. So I think uh, we have to make sure, first of all, that uh, all voices are heard and everyone is represented fairly. Um, moreover, I think that um, as newcomer as uh, early talents we we need to be there why because we might not have the experience and not having professional experience means that we might not have the standards of working so with we can come up with questions with ideas to to really encourage this this change and also uh i think we have to make room also for early talents um and i'll finish with this because um, we are in digitalization, as it was previously mentioned. So this is one of the biggest challenges for pharma industry. And you have to really face it and overcome it in order to move forward. And as newcomers, as early talents, majority of us were born uh, in the digital era. So I think we, we can really make um, a success and we can really um, help to, to adapt the evolution. And I could just come in here um, and echo what Sharon was saying about appointing a chief DNI officer. I think that's really important. It's important to actually invest in this process. I think, you know, we can't expect it to just be an organic change. It has to be pushed. We have to be active in this change. And so I think, you know, employing someone to lead that is really important. It's also important that it's, you know, cascaded from leadership. So the experiences that we've had at Plan, you know, there there are always going to be organic grassroots groups who are pushing to be more inclusive. You know, we have voluntary staff networks that are working on equality and um, gender gender equality and racial equality. But that is people's time and effort in addition to their workload, and it's often normally more junior staff so it's really important I think to invest in specific people to lead the process from above as well as listening to to the grassroots movements from below um, and then also I really liked what Sharon said about challenging the status quo and I think this is something that's really important in DNI and very difficult because the status quo is seen as the norm it's seen as this is just the way we do things and so to actually step forward and challenge that is very difficult but Without doing that, we're not going to change anything and we're not going to see a more inclusive world. Thanks. So, Courtney, maybe I can add one more thing. I think what's important there in terms of that, um, the ability to speak up is to have that space where you can speak up, where you can, when you see something that's not right, you have the opportunity to bring it to the attention of management in a safe environment, right? It comes back to what is that safe environment? But I think if we, we build a culture that doesn't accept that uh, the status quo or the behaviors that have um, enabled the status quo, I think it really does allow for that opportunity to, to start to change and to start to grow in that way and, and to shift that. And um, I think the other piece of it, at least in, in my career, I've seen um, our, our younger generation who are very much the grassroots behind a lot of initiatives that we, we are working through. Um, and I think it there's a big opportunity for those folks that are um, in senior leadership roles to, to stop and think about, well, just because that's the way you did it coming up doesn't mean it's the right way. It's just the way it was done at that time and time changes. And the idea of being a digital 
generation, um, you know, never knowing a time without a computer or potentially a cell phone is a very different space. And so it's time that um, some of us that are in uh, the, the latter part of our career, maybe, um, we need to look and see how, how can we change too and adapt to that because it, it really does make a difference for the future of, of not just our, our companies, but of our healthcare systems, of our, uh, you know, if we go to the maternal health, also the future of, of our uh, families as well. Great, thank you, Sharon. Um, and it looks like we have a question in the chat uh, from Patricia Fernandez. I don't know if we're able to kind of un unmute Patricia and let her ask her question directly. Um, is that possible? Other Otherwise, I am happy to answer it, ask it on behalf of her. Oh, great. Hello. Nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. Please go ahead. So, Rocio, thank you so much for the insights on this eMERGE uh, program. I'm also a new joiner in the biopharma sector, so I actually can relate to what you're saying. My question would be, what drove UCB to create that program? What need did they see and were trying to solve? And what made you also well, want to be invested in that program? What thought, what did you think you could contribute with? Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Interesting question because uh, my journey at Emerge evolved. Uh, the program was already there when I arrived and well, I moved uh, to Brussels in the middle of the pandemic. So literally the making connections was very difficult and kind to settle in, in a new city as well. So I joining I joined as uh, to emerge as a participant, going to events, trying to connect with people. But at some point, I I found my safe space. Uh, I felt very comfortable, and it's funny because um, from emerge community, they needed a bit of extra support because we do this aside of our job. And well, I was very thankful, and of course, I got inspired. So I said, like, yeah, sure, I. I'll, I'll be there to, to support. And since then, um, everything we do, we try to make it a little bit better and better because I really want to give back or pay back what, what Emerge did for me. And what are the needs that, um, that we are covering? Uh, well, it, I'm coming back to the safe space. To create a safe space, you need first to have a, a comfortable and a nice welcome. So otherwise you are in this big pharma company and as I said, it can be a bit intimidated. Um, then you create this sense of belonging. You, you start sharing your experience, uh, listening from others and that makes you also grow. And a, a really good point when, when you hear others or when you belong, belong to Emerge, it helps you to get the big picture of how this big company works. How is the strategy of the company, of the departments, and I think, yeah, when you create those safe space, uh, you jump into into taking risk. And yeah, for example, I jump into participating into this webinar through Emerge as well. So for me, it's going up from my comfort zone. And yeah, I'm very thankful. That's why I'm still at, at Emerge and I'm going to be, yeah, thank you. Right, so we have just a few minutes longer. I wonder if there's any additional questions from attendees. Otherwise, I'll leave it open to our amazing panelists to provide any final thoughts um, and for our hosts to share the results of the word cloud whenever you're ready. Shall we share the word cloud if someone could? Yes, great. Thank you. Equity. It looks like equity was the main answer by far. <laughs> what else do we have on here? What is the first inclusion of the equity, which is different from equality? So it's great to see that on screen. Contamination, empowerment, cooperation, belonging, richness, the future, gender balance, equitable access, role models, 
but at the center of it all is equity, right? Yes, Gabriella, very inspiring. Does, would anyone from the audience like to make any comments on what they thought or what they learned today, how they can apply this to their role? Um, I personally found it incredibly inspiring and there's so many layers to think about when it comes to how you can act and think more inclusive in your work, in your personal life. Um, so please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to make a comment. It looks like we are also viewing poll results. So thank you for that. The correct answer is, are we seeing the correct answer? It looks like most people chose 28%. Are we going to have the answer here? That's the right answer, Courtney. That is the right answer. Short, but it's 28, yeah. It is 28%, which is, which is very low, the percentage of women in STEM. So the majority of us got that right, but unfortunately, it is still low. So it's not something that we need to work on together and encourage women and girls from around the world to get into STEM fields. Um, I do know that women and young, you know, young women have been um, disproportionately impacted by the COVID pandemic. They're more likely to have disruptions to their education, less likely to be able to seek healthcare. And as a result of that, again, less likely to enter the workforce and be able to complete their education. And this will have a lasting impact on the career and economic opportunities for women around the world. So let's all do what we can to support support women in STEM fields and support you know, everyone from diverse backgrounds whenever we can. Any final thoughts from our panelists before we, before we say goodbye today? Um, I just have yeah, a we'll get there. I, <laughs> you go ahead. You go ahead. No, no, no. I just wanted to drop a comment that, okay, now is that percentage, but just even with those with this webinar and stuff, I think we'll get there. It's just little by little. It will not change overnight, but it will. Thanks, Rocio. Go ahead, Laura. I was just re going to reflect on the fact that equity was the main um, word that people put in, which is really interesting because I think that to which to use an equitable approach, we have to be very active um, in our approach. And so that kind of speaks to everything that I said in my um, presentation. You know, we really need to to redress historical and current discriminations and be um, active in that approach. So, yeah, I'm really glad to see a commitment to equity within this group. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And I think that that is the perfect way to end the call today and leave it on that note of how we can all apply it in in our lives and in our careers. So once again, thank you to all our panelists today for your time and for sharing your experiences and your learnings with us. I personally found it incredibly insightful um, and I know everyone on the call did as well. So thank you to all our attendees for joining. Thank you to IFPMA and Hyper for organizing the call. And this is a series of webinars that will be on different topics. So we hope to see you at the next one as well. Have a great rest of the day, everyone.